Ephesus chapter 24. Verse 1 to 7. Exodus chapter 24. Exodus 24. And we're going to just look at uh, three, two verses at this time. Exodus 24, we uh, looked at these verses this morning a little bit. Exodus 24, looking at verse 12 and 13. Exodus 24, verse 12 and 13, that reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone, and a law, and commandments, which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And Moses went up, sorry, and Moses rose up and his minister Joshua, and Moses went up into the mount of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for being able to at this time, uh, Lord, just uh, come before you, before the throne of grace, and, and Lord, seek your leading and your guiding in your word at this time. Uh, Lord, may uh, the Holy Spirit of God just uh, give us this afternoon what you would have us to get. Uh, Lord, may, may uh, your word speak to our hearts truly. Uh, Lord, this afternoon, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so here we see Joshua in these two verses, uh, not for the first time in the word of God, but this is where he's uh, first named as Moses' minister in the word. And uh, it doesn't mean that he pastored Moses, uh, but it means that he was Moses' servant. And uh, as I mentioned this morning, I'm sure, a minister here means to attend as a menial or a servant to serve or wait on. And that was Joshua's lot in serving God uh, in, in this time with Moses. Uh, if you study through, uh, through Joshua's life, you can see that he attended to whatever uh, Moses required of him. And uh, the mind goes quickly back to Exodus 17, where uh, the... Uh, the Amalekites came to attack Israel and of course they needed to defend themselves and so it was automatically asked of Joshua to, to select men out of Israel to, to defend them uh, and he did and, and uh, he did as required, there was, there was no fuss, there was no complaints uh, and uh, you know, he didn't sort of go to Moses and say, hey Moses look I'm your servant, I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, this, this battle stuff, I don't know about that, you know, no, no, no he didn't do that. He was, he, he just went and did what Moses uh, required of him. And when he up, went up into the mount with Moses and, and waited for him halfway up and he was there for 40 days, uh, yes, he got a big blessing to be able to go as close as he did to God's presence on the mount, but he sat there for over a month waiting on Moses to come back down. And, uh, you know, I know, you know, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but I, I, look, at it, I look at that and I think about, my, uh, sorry, Joshua sitting there Halfway up the mount, you know, you can see all of you know, there's all action happening up there. You know, there's the cloud on the mountain and, and bits of lightning and thunders and so forth and so on going on. And, and uh, he knows Moses is right up there in God's presence. And here he is, he's sitting down there on, he's got a hard rock for a chair and, and uh, he's walking around and he's probably, he can, he's probably counted the amount of pebbles that are there in that area that he's waiting for Moses in 16 times in that time, trying to figure out, you know, something or trying to, trying to get something to do. And uh, I, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm the kind of person that if I'm, <clears throat> if I'm just going to wait and do, do something, just wait for someone, I'm kind of, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, if I haven't had anything to do. So here he is, he's sitting on the side of the mountain, waiting for 40 days faithfully for, for Moses, uh, whom he served. And uh, he, was, he was always just faithfully doing whatever was required of him and uh, there was no complaint when Moses came back down from God's presence uh, he didn't say hey Moses you know it's been pretty rugged down here I'm sleeping on the on the ground look you have a look you, know, you can see where I've been lying there's all rocks and pebbles they're everywhere no 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 he, he never said anything and so Joshua served as Moses minister for 40 years uh, as they wandered around the wilderness without complaint without expectation. Now, go over to Psalm 84. Psalm 84. Psalm 84. Psalm 84. 
Psalm 84 reads here, for a day, sorry, verse number 10, I should say, Psalm 84, verse 10, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Now, um, I, I know uh, the comparison that's made there is, is you know, it, rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than to, to be you know, in, in amongst all the wicked, to dwell in amongst the wicked all the time. But nonetheless, there's, a, there's a, uh, something that we can glean from this. And, uh, you know, uh, it applies, you can apply it to someone who would rather be content in their walk with simply being a, a doorkeeper in the house of God. In other words, uh, like Joshua's attitude, he didn't expect that beyond uh, which he was just asked to do. You don't see that in Joshua's attitude. He was just content with where God wanted him to be. And if, if, if he was just to be a doorkeeper in the house of God, he would have been content with that. I mean, he's, here he was, he was a menial servant to, to, uh, to, to Moses for all of those years. You sort of think about it, 40 years, it's a long time. And, and you know, uh, when, uh, when I uh, started work in the bank, when I, when I finished school, I went straight from high school into the bank, had two weeks holiday, and then, then started. Uh, in those days, in those days, no, sorry, anyway, in those days, um, it was normal for people to work 40 years in the same job. And, uh, and I can remember a, you know, a couple of, <coughs> excuse me, a couple of guys uh, getting uh, the gold watch for 40 years of service in the bank. And, uh, and you know, that wasn't, it wasn't something of going, oh, well, he managed to make 40 years. No, it was, it was acknowledged that it was uh, a great thing. But at the same time, uh, it wasn't uh, something that would blow your mind. Because it, you know, in those days, you, know, you, you, you worked in the same job, you were you're content with what you had, you lived in the same house for, uh, you know, for decades. I mean, you look at the, uh, the house across the road there, the, the dear lady that's just moved, moved out. And, uh, and so, it, that was normal. And people were content with their lives. And, uh, and, that's, and that, was, that was Joshua. He was content with, with what he was. Um, now, uh, let's go to Numbers 27 and have a look at something else here before we get into a few points. Uh, Numbers 27. Numbers 27 in your Bibles. Now this is where um, they're already basically done their journey, journeying through the wilderness. They've had many uh, ups and downs, uh, probably more, more downs than ups in the earlier stages, in the, in the earlier years of their wanderings in the wilderness. Uh, and uh, by this time here in Numbers 27, uh, Moses uh, is already uh, reaching the end of his time on earth because uh, he was not going to lead the children of Israel into the Promised Land. Why? Because the second time the Lord uh, was going to let him draw a rock out, uh, sorry, water out of the rock, the second time he was to speak to the rock, not to, not to hit it. But in his anger, he smote the rock. He didn't just uh, hit it once, he hit it twice. And, uh, and so because of that, uh, he didn't get to enter the Promised Land. Now, we know the Lord showed him the Promised Land from the mountain, but, um, but nonetheless, he didn't get to enter it. Now, have a look in uh, verse 13. We just sort of glint, we'll just we'll glance through uh, verse 13 through to verse 21. So in verse 13, um, we'll start in verse 12, sorry. Uh, the Lord said to Moses, Get thee up into this mount uh, of Aaron, and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. And when thou hast seen it, thou also shalt be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother was gathered. And so in other words, because of what I've just mentioned before, he's you know, smiting the rock <coughs> uh, when he should have spoken to it, uh, which is what the Lord's talking about in verse 14, that he rebelled there. Um, Moses didn't get to enter. And so look at verse 15. Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of uh, the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. And so here's Moses. Now he has, Moses here obviously has no expectation that it would be Joshua. Uh, if, he, if, he, if he knew it was already going to be Joshua, he wouldn't have asked that. And so he said, Lord, uh, set somebody over. Uh, the, the, the congregation 
and uh, verse 17, which may go out before them and which may go in before them and uh, which may lead them out and which may bring them in that the congregation of the Lord be not as a shepherd which have no, sorry, as sheep which have no shepherd. And so verse 18, we see the Lord tells Moses to take Joshua, the son of Nun, and uh, to lay his hand on him. Uh, verse 19, set him before Eleazar, Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation. Uh, give him a charge in their sight. Verse 20, and thou shalt put some of thine honour upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. And so it goes on. So Moses did what he what he's told to do in verse 22 and at verse 23. And so, so here we see uh, Joshua, the man that's been Moses' servant for 40 years. Uh, all of a sudden he's been, he's been plucked out of being the menial servant into, into being the leader of Israel. There was no expectation on his part. Uh, Moses had no, from what we can see there, Moses had no expectation that it would be Joshua. And, uh, and in putting him into that place uh, where, he, where, he then led, where Joshua then led the children of Israel into to Israel, in, in doing that, uh, you know, we see that Moses had to bring him before all the congregation of Israel and, and show them uh, who was going to be their next leader and uh, you know, give him a charge and, and so forth, as we see there in those verses. And uh, Moses' replacement was there right beside him all the time. But you don't see that the Joshua was trying to angle his way into, into being the next leader. He, had, he was content with whatever God had wanted him to be right throughout. And for most of that time from the Exodus to the rest of his, for the rest of his life was just as a menial servant. Now, at points this afternoon are these, uh, and I've already kind of alluded to this part already. Number one, having a servant's heart brings contentment. Having a servant's heart brings contentment. You know, I, uh, I, I, I think about uh, when the church started in Toowoomba uh, back uh, in 2000, the year 2000, and I mentioned this before, but it's so true. You know, uh, at that particular time, uh, ministry for me was, was very simple. Uh, yeah, I was the treasurer of the church and stuff like that, but, and one of the deacons and, and so forth and so on. But, uh, you know, life was, life was, was different. Uh, the Lord had, it, had myself and, and uh, Pastor Tim, basically, we were, we were uh, the founding pastors to, to use a term in the right way, don't take us the wrong way, but we were his servants in the ministry. Uh, as I've shared before, we'd go in on Saturday mornings into the church, at the building that we used for a church, which was an old church anyway, move all of the furniture uh, out from, the, from in the main area there that was uh, used by the, by the people that owned the building during the week, stack it all up in this little back room, right up just about to the ceiling, uh, where you just about bend yourself trying to get the sofa lounges down and things like that. And then we'd go out door knocking and share, try to share the gospel. And you know, uh, uh, the, those things like doing the packing up and, and setting up and then on Sunday evening pulling it all back down again and resetting up ready for the, for the owners to use during the week. All of those kinds of things that, that we did in those times we were content and we were happy with that because we knew that we were just serving God in the way that he wanted us to do. You know, uh, in our lives, we, we tend to want, to want to have some big thing that we can say that we're doing for God. And while, that, while that's a blessing, if God ha would have that in our lives, uh, the smaller things are a blessing too, you know. And we would be content with whatever God uh, wants. And we can see that, you know, like for example, Joshua, you know, uh, it, it talks about in the, in um, over there in Peter. It says, uh, "Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time." Well, here was here was Joshua, a menial servant. He humbled himself for forty years, and and then uh, was content. And in due time, God exalted him. He lifted him up to where he where he was to be. 
you know, you don't hear you don't see Joshua complaining about about uh, about his role in all, in all of those years. And and uh, when and when the Lord did put His hand on Joshua to be uh, the leader, He didn't go, oh, you know, forty years, come on, I've been forty years in the wilderness, I'm about to retire in a number of years. No, He didn't say that. He just He transitioned from the menial servant to the leader of Israel because he was content in what God would have in his life in the different stages of life. He seamlessly moved into his new role knowing that God, God it, that was what God had ordained and, and set about serving him in that role. And so if the Lord had said to Joshua to be a, a doorkeeper in the house of God, then guess what? He would have gone and done that and gone, yeah, okay, that's fine. Not a problem. It's what God ordains in our lives that we should yearn for. Not what we yearn for in ourselves. Secondly, contentment in what the Lord has ordained for us individually brings loyalty to God. Uh, the reason why Mo, uh, sorry, Joshua was loyal to Moses in his service to him was because he was loyal to God. Did Joshua see a perfect man you know, when he was being Moses' uh, minister? No, of course not. Uh, because you know, we've all got a sinful nature. But the ultimate thing that made uh, Joshua what he was was because he was loyal towards God. Because he was content in whatever God had in his life. Now let's have a look at uh, two things uh, here. Uh, let's look at, um, at Joshua as he uh, starts to be the, the leader of Israel. I'll go to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. In Joshua chapter 5, have a look at verses 13 to 15. In Joshua 5 verse 13 to 15, we see here where uh, the children of Israel, Joshua's led them across the, uh, the River Jordan. Um, you know, they've hit the, the River Jordan and, and the waters have parted and they've gone across some dry land and they're on the other side and so uh, in verse 13 it says and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and uh, we looked at this verse, these verses last week and it says and behold there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand and Joshua went unto him and said uh, unto him art thou for us or for our adversaries. Now, this was not the indicator of a man that had a big opinion of himself. This was, the, this was an indicator uh, of a man that was loyal to his God. And you might say, how do you know that? Well, look at verse 14. It says, and, and he said, that is the man that had his sword drawn, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? See that? He was still a servant. He was content with whatever God uh, had for him in his life. And uh, even though Moses is now gone, uh, in Joshua's heart, he's still just a servant. He's not this one of, oh, well, look at me now, I'm the big shot now. I've got a couple of million people under me now. Yeah, pretty good, hey? No, no, he wasn't. Not at all. He was still just a servant in his heart. He was content with whatever God wanted and it, and it brought loyalty as a natural result. And you can see that there in that verse. He fell down on his face and worshipped. What saith my Lord unto his servant? And, uh, and it says, the captain of the, And the captain of the Lord's host, verse 15, said unto Joshua, Loose uh, thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place wherein they standest is holy, and Joshua did so. Uh, no, no doubt, I won't pull my shoe off because it, you know, that, that'll be a, a horrific thing. But you know, Joshua pulled his shoes straight off, and and uh, he's there just worshiping God. Uh, he's content with whatever God wants. In his heart, he's still, uh, still just a servant. Uh, he didn't he didn't get a bloated liver, as we say, um, about where, where he's at. Uh, and he's loyal to the Lord. Yeah, brethren, that's, that's what we ought to look at for ourselves. Sometimes we can look 
at our wives and think, oh man, you know, isn't there more to life than this for, for me? But if you are doing what God wants you to do and you are where God wants you to be, be content. Because in contentment comes joy. Becomes it, 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 With contentment comes uh, a, a, a satisfied life where, where we're not searching for more. Oh, there's got to be more out there. No, if you're where God wants you to be, being what God wants you to be, doing what He wants you to do, uh, then contentment will, 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 will reign in our lives and we will stop searching. Was Joshua like that for the rest of his life? Well, we've seen that he was like that all through the 40 years that he was Moses' minister or servant. We can see that at, his, at the beginning of his leadership of Israel. Now let's go to uh, Joshua 24. Joshua 24. And let's have a look uh, in verses 14 and 15. Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. He gets to the, uh, the end of his life. And uh, Joshua calls all of the, the children of Israel together and he's going to challenge them because he knows it's coming to the end. Uh, you know, history, history says that um, yeah, Joshua only led the children of Israel into, into uh, the promised land for about seven years. Whether that's correct or not, I don't know, but that, that would probably make sense. Um, and so uh, have a look there at these verses. In Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15, he's, he's challenging the children of Israel. He says, Now therefore, fear the Lord, and do what? And serve Him. Serve Him in sincerity and in truth. Joshua never lost his servant's heart. It was never a thing of, oh, boy, I'm getting, I'm getting close to the end. How am I going to provide for my family when I'm gone? Uh, I, better, I better do something here to... to uh, to, to pad my retirement or to pad this time so that my, my family have got plenty to go on with when I'm dead. No, 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 he didn't do that. He said, now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. Then verse 15, and if it seem evil unto you to do what? To serve the Lord. Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether, you, whether the gods your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will, future tense, we will serve the Lord. Uh, that, that's the confidence that Joshua had. And, and uh, that, that his family would continue to do so. Now let's have a look at the end of the chapter. At the end of the chapter here, Joshua 24, down towards the end. Uh, verse 31, Joshua's dead. Okay, Joshua's gone uh, by this time. And it says there in verse 31, And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua, which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. Why was it like that? Why did Israel continue to serve the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that overlived him, which had known all the works of the Lord. Because Joshua was a leader that was content. He showed the fruit of sincere service to God. He showed the fruit in his life. And that influenced the children of Israel. You know, if Joshua hadn't have been content with who he was and what God would have him to do as the leader of Israel, uh, things would have gone pear-shaped. They wouldn't have followed the Lord you know, after he was gone for those years. And you, and you say, well, how do you know that? Well, you've only got to read through the Old Testament. You've only got to look at the kings that didn't serve the Lord. You've only got to look at the kings that, that, that uh, did evil in the sight of the Lord that weren't content with who they were and they tried to be the big shots and everything else and see what happened to Israel. And so it had a lasting effect. Josh, that Joshua had, he, sorry, he had that contentment which led to loyalty which had that lasting effect on the Israelites. Now thirdly and finally, have a look at uh, Joshua, we we'll go back to Joshua chapter 5 again and then chapter 6. 
Joshua 5 and then chapter 6. Joshua 5 and chapter 6. So Joshua 5, it's the same verses there, verses 13 to 15. But then also in chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. And the third point is this. Contentment as a servant of God brings obedience. It brings obedience. Um, and we'll think of an example or two here in a minute. But, uh, but here in these verses, first of all, Joshua 5, verses 13 to 15, is the time we, that we've just looked at. Uh, the captain of the Lord's host uh, came there before Joshua. Joshua fell down and worshipped the Lord. And then in chapter 6, uh, we see there in verses 1 to 5, uh, the plan. How were they going to con conquer the this, this city of Jericho, which was extremely well fortified? How are they going to conquer that? Well, the Lord gives him, the Lord gives him the, the plan. He gives him the plan. He says, okay, Joshua, you get the people to, to march around the outside of the city once a day for six days, and then the seventh day you go around seven times, and then you blow your trumpets and, and, uh, and shout, and, and, the, and the walls will fall down. Now, we, we all know that, you know, that, that as a plan, that's ridiculous. But it was a matter of obedience, wasn't it? If you're content in the Lord, you know that what God says to you through his word, that he lays on your heart, that he leads you in, you know it's true. And though it might seem impossible what he wants you to do, God is true to his word. And so if we are content in the Lord, we will do as the Lord wants us to do. And, and it will, in other words, we will be obedient to God the classic example that we see uh, in the Word of God of someone that the Lord uh, showed himself that he would be all that he told he would be uh, is Saul, king, the first king of Israel. You know, if you think about the, when he was anointed to be king and he's presented before the children of Israel, uh, at, at, you know, in that time there, uh, the Lord said that on his way home uh, from, from Samuel, that he would be uh, turned into another man, given a new heart, uh, he would prophesy, uh, and, and so forth, and the Spirit of God would come upon him. And, and those things happened, as if to say, you know, what I've said to you, Saul, is true. Be content. Be sure that I'm with you. Be content in who you are and what I want you to be. But we, we, uh, we know that from uh, his early years uh, as king, that Saul wasn't content. Uh, we know that Saul disobeyed God and that cost him the, the kingship or cost his family the kingship of Israel. And so, uh, and so obedience is a natural result of being content. The, the king, the, the crown of Israel just kind of never quite fitted on Saul's head properly, did it? It just seemed like uh, he, was, he was out of... Yeah, it just, it just wasn't something right there from the get-go, uh, including Saul's own attitude. But let's make a comparison. Let's think about David. David uh, had, uh, sorry, David was a man after God's own heart that fulfilled all his will, and he loved the Lord with all his heart, and we know he's the, the sweet psalmist of Israel, and you, you look at the psalms there that God inspired him to write and so forth. And... Uh, David gets towards yeah, the latter end of his life and, and it's on his heart to build, uh, to build a temple. Let's go to 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 17 and let's see an example now of someone that, that was content, someone that was obedient because of that and, uh, and let's see the results. So 1 Chronicles 17, uh, first of all looking in verses, uh, 1 Chronicles 17, uh, look at verses uh, 1 to 4 first of all. So here in verses 1 to 4 we see David had on his heart to build the temple. Uh, look at verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass as David sat in his house that David said to Nathan the prophet, Lo, I dwell in the house of cedars, but the ark uh, of the covenant of the Lord remaineth under curtains. Then Nathan said unto David, Do all that is in thine heart, for God is with thee. Uh, verse 3, And it came to pass the same night that the word of God came to Nathan, saying, uh, Go and tell David my servant, Thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not build me a house to dwell in. And, and we know that's because David had been a man of war during his, 
during his life as king, and, uh, and he defended Israel and so forth. But nonetheless, the Lord wanted someone that, uh, that had not shed blood uh, in, in uh, leading the army of Israel and so forth, but uh, that ended up being Solomon. Now, what was David's reaction? What did, he, what did he say? Well, let's go to verses 16 to 19. Verses 16 to 19 of the first chapter, of that chapter, I should say. Nathan, the prophet's already gone back to David and said, no, you're not going to build the house. Uh, the Lord said that, uh, no, it's not going to be you, it'll be your son. And God's going to put his blessing on, on, the, on you. And, and, and he makes all these promises. Uh, if you read through that chapter later. And what did David say? And David the king came and, came and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is mine house that thou hast brought me hitherto? And yet this was a small thing in thine eyes, O God, for thou hast also spoken of thy servant's house for a great while to come and hast regarded me according to the estate of a man of high degree, O Lord God. What can David speak more to thee for the honour of thy servant? For thou knowest thy servant. You see, he keeps using that word servant there. About himself. Verse 19. O Lord, for thy servant's sake, there it is again, and according to thine own heart, thou hast done all this greatness in making known all these great things. David's content with what God wants him to be. And we know that the temple, when it was built, it was magnificent. There's never been anything like it. And, and probably never will be again. The splendor, with all the gold overlay and all that sort of stuff. And David had it in his heart to do that for the Lord. He loved the Lord. He was content in God. He was loyal to God. And we can see here uh, that he was obedient to God. It, he didn't say, well, God, you know, um, you know, I've served all these years and I've got all this stuff set aside to build a temple and I'll, it'll be magnificent and it, it's worthy of worship. To, you know, it'll be a wonderful place for the people of Israel to come to worship you. No, no, he didn't. The Lord made him other promises because he knew David's heart. And, and, and I love that verse there. Verse number 18, verse number 18 of that same chapter, what can David speak more to thee? What, what else can I say, Lord, for the honour of thy servant? What, you, you've honoured me, Lord, why? What, 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 what else can I say? David's just sitting there, and that's what it says in verse at number, uh, where are we? Uh, verse number 16, it says, And David the king came and sat before the Lord. It, it's kind of, it, and, and I know this doesn't do it justice, but to use an illustration, David's gobsmacked. We understand that word. That's English. What well, kind of English? And so here's David. He's just sitting there and he's just going, Wow. What, what, what else can I say, Lord? I don't deserve this. It's kind of like, you know, he's, he's just overcome with what God has promised. David's loyalty, uh, sorry, David's contentment, uh, it, it, it brought loyalty towards the Lord. David's contentment then brings, uh, as a servant of God, brings obedience, or brought obedience. And we see that with, with Joshua also. Uh, that was Joshua, as we've already seen. He's the uh, captain of the Lord's host appearing to him and he just falls down and worships him. And you see in these men's lives, they didn't go, well, I'm king of Israel. No, no, no. They say, Lord, I'm your servant. I'm just your servant. I'm content. You know, David would be content to be a doorkeeper in the house of God if that's what God had wanted. Same with Joshua. Let me ask you a question. How about us? How about us? How content are we in our lives with what God 
has done for us? Does it engender contentment? Does it engender, sorry, loyalty in our hearts to the Lord and what He wants in our lives? Does it engender obedience? Where if God doesn't want something that we want, we just go, okay, God, it's all right. I'm happy with whatever you want, Lord. Is that you and me? What does God see when he looks down from heaven on our hearts? Well, let me just close with this. Joshua 24, over there where, uh, where Joshua challenged the children of Israel. And as for me and my house, we will do what? Serve the Lord. We'll serve the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for being able to think on these things this evening. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we can look at your servant Joshua, uh, your servant David too, for that matter. And Lord, see a couple of great examples that should be a, uh, a great testimony for us, a great inspiration for us to just, uh, Lord, be content in our lives with what you would have us to be, what you would have us to do. And Lord, uh, where we could honestly say, if you just want us to be a doorkeeper in the house of God, then uh, we'd be happy with that. And Lord, uh, Father, I, I just pray that uh, these things that we've looked at from the Word of God uh, today, throughout the day, uh, would truly be uh, things that would speak to our hearts that we would, uh, Lord, desire to apply these lessons to our lives that we've got from your word. Lord, that we would be that little bit more transformed in our lives according to your will. And Father, I thank you and praise you for these things. Lord, I just ask and pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you and good evening.